if you notice the title of the message, we do life together. Uh, let me see, uh, is, uh, the, is it seen on the screen, uh, Manoa? Yes, thank you. Yeah. We do life together is actually, uh, you know, a, 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 mot a motto adopted by uh, another church. And I'm just borrowing uh, their phrase and I found it to uh, say so much uh, about life being life or doing life together. And it began to help me see the importance of fellowship. You know, when we talk about fellowship uh, as Christians, we understand fellowship in a very unique manner, don't we? Uh, and the biblical teaching of fellowship goes beyond the typical worldly perspective. Uh, we are used to things like business meetings and uh, meetings to strike deals or come together for agreements. Uh, we talk about board meetings. And so we have, we are used to all kinds of meetings, but when we talk about fellowship from a biblical perspective, uh, it goes much beyond just mere meetings that we talk about. And so today, even as we meet to uh, worship together, it is much more than just a meeting. It is a fellowship. And hopefully, as we go on, you will see how much more uh, uh, you know, profound it is when we talk about Christian fellowship. You know, the young people are constantly developing new vocabulary, especially when you have the, uh, uh, you know, the social media. And I am shocked that to see how many new words are being coined uh, in the way they communicate. And one of the new words I have heard out, I've heard is hangout. <laughs> I don't know if you've heard uh, young people say that they'd like to go and hang out. They'll call their friends and say, hey, would you like to hang out with me? And I was just thinking to myself, when we talk about fellowship, perhaps it is a little bit more like the young people saying, let's hang out together. But obviously, the biblical perspective of fellowship goes much, much more deeper. Now, uh, when we talk about fellowship, you know, uh, it's unfortunate, but we have to talk about the pandemic. Um, the pandemic, in one sense, has shown us what we are missing. We are missing fellowship in, a, in, in person, together, where we can come together and meet together. And we are beginning to see how fellowship is so important, isn't it? Now, the pandemic has made us to preach and adopt new ways of preaching. And uh, I still am a little uncomfortable preaching to a laptop screen, <laughs> even though I can see some of you in the little boxes. But to preach to a laptop screen uh, looks a little strange uh, because I can't see the smiling faces because you are so small in that little box. When we are together, it is so much more nicer to see your smiling faces or maybe sometimes some sleeping faces. <laughs> but nevertheless, uh, you know, the pandemic has shown us how uh, we are missing fellowship. The other day I was talking to uh, Madhu, our member from uh, Sainik Puri, and uh, she was, we were talking about, you know, church and she said she misses church so much. And she's looking forward when we can again come together and enjoy time together, right? Now, thankfully, this online worship that we do has given us some advantages, especially, as I was mentioning, some of our outstation brethren, uh, the participation that we are able to have you uh, with us uh, is a tremendous blessing. And of course, uh, even as Praveen was uh, talking about the Advent service, recently we had the Asian worship celebration. That is a tremendous blessing uh, because 
the pandemic has forced us to go online. But interestingly enough, this only shows how much we would like to be together, isn't it? Uh, this only proves that we want to be connected. We want to remain in touch. And so uh, the pandemic in one sense has opened our eyes to uh, some of these aspects, but it has also shown us how lonely people are. You know, uh, we hear about increased depression amongst people, uh, sometimes leading to suicidal tendencies. And that is very, very unfortunate that, uh, you know, being cooped up at home and the social isolation that we have tends to, uh, you know, bring out these unfortunate uh, matters. Children are missing school. Uh, and uh, there is enough evidence that loneliness and isolation can kill. And if you see the uh, picture on your screen, it is so sad that, you know, so many people have to just isolate themselves. And the usual buzz of, you know, we see in a restaurant or, you know, is, is kind of missing. And interestingly enough, you know, in uh, this, this sense of isolation is, uh, is can be very dangerous. Let me just show you a scripture where it talks about, you know, what Peter talks about how we are uh, in danger to be devoured. It, it says, be sober minded, be watchful. Your enemy, the devil prowls around like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. Now, we know that Satan is our arch enemy seeking to, to destroy. And you know, one of the strategies that he uses is isolation and loneliness. Uh, if you look at this picture, uh, here is an animal that is isolated and removed from the herd. And you know, lions and uh, other prey Praying animals like to attack those isolated animals because it's much easier to destroy them. Uh, and perhaps that tells us and shows us that there is a danger in not being in fellowship with brethren, with members. And that is what the biblical perspective begins to help us understand. That fellowship is very important. Being together and doing things together. If I can go back to my title, doing life together is something that the Bible talks about as being important. So today I'd like to just, uh, uh, you know, spend a few moments on showing you why the Bible stresses the importance of fellowship. And I'm going to give you three points on how the Bible focuses on fellowship being vital for our Christian lives. Now, some of these points may be a reminder for some of us, but many a times it's worth repeating a few things so that we don't forget important aspects of Christian living. Firstly, uh, life we should understand is fundamentally relational. You know, in the community of the Trinity, now, uh, you know, that's a, that's a pretty long sentence, but one of the things that you begin to see when you read the scriptures, uh, that life is fundamentally relational. And I think the biblical scriptures are unique in this respect. It shows, it, it helps to highlight the importance of relationality and the sense of community. Uh, you know, the, the way we worship God is not in isolation. We don't have just a relationship with God uh, in isolation or isolating ourselves with others. But there is a relationality that is very intrinsically connected in the community of the Trinity. All right. Uh, let me just go back to the reading today. You remember uh, Nelson uh, led us in the in the scripture reading in from 1 John chapter 1, and I'm uh, dropping down to verse 3. Notice it says, we proclaim to you what we have seen and heard so that you also may have fellowship 
with us. Notice the word fellowship there. And our fellowship is with the Father and with us and with his Son, Jesus Christ. We write this to make our joy complete. So it begins by saying, We proclaim to you what we have seen and heard. Obviously, the reference is to Jesus Christ. What who they have seen, who they have heard, and who they have also touched, because that is mentioned in the earlier scriptures. Uh, they are proclaiming Jesus Christ. So in other words, they are not proclaiming something from their imagination. They are proclaiming something that they seem to be thinking as, you know, being true. No, this is something they have seen, heard, and touched. All right. Now, the question I want to ask is, what is the purpose and result of this proclamation? Why is this proclamation being made? And that is where we come to this very important point. So that you also may have fellowship with us. And the proclamation, uh, the, the fellowship is not just with us, but with the Father and with the Son, Jesus Christ. So the proclamation is an invitation to fellowship. All right. Uh, it shows us that we worship a God of fellowship. You know, and notice it says the fellowship is with the Father and with the Son. And obviously it is in the Holy Spirit. Interestingly enough, Selena talked about the Holy Spirit coming upon us, which connects us with the Father and with the Son. And so uh, there is this, that is where the community of the Trinity comes in. The fellowship being with the Father and the Son in the Holy Spirit is also with us. And that's very important. Some people, and just recently I heard some preachers saying, Oh, you don't have to give importance to fellowship with others, with people. Your fellowship with Jesus is more than sufficient. But that is not what I read from the scriptures. Right? I believe that the, the, the fellowship in the community of this trinity forces us to have fellowship with one another. Right? Even as we recognize the union in the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, because life originates there and is sustained in the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. But that is where the best kind of fellowship takes place. And that is where the best kind of fellowship begins to overflow from us to all of our brothers and sisters, all of us together. And interestingly enough, notice verse 4. We write this to make our joy complete. That is where joy is made complete, right? Uh, in other words, joy, complete joy is found in the fellowship of the Father, Son, Spirit, and with one another. So you begin to see how important fellowship is. All right, let me just uh, mention a few more things and uh, I'll just close that screen for a moment. You know, uh, you must have heard of Dietrich Bonhoeffer. He was, uh, you know, a, a very a stalwart in the Christian faith, lived during the Second World War, and of course, actually was uh, incarcerated in the concentration camps. And uh, he made an interesting statement. He said, and he was a very strong Christian. He said, you cannot go on with life alone. You cannot live life alone. You see, the nature of life is in community. Uh, it can be lived only in community. It can be only lived relationally. Relationality is in community is fundamental to life. And if I can uh, use a scientific word there, it is the DNA, right? The DNA of life, that is, what is the DNA of life? Fellowship. Fellowship in community. Now, DNA, if, uh, I don't know if, uh, uh, I was just trying to think, what is this DNA? Actually, is the full, the full form of it is uh, diosei ribonucleic acid. I'm not sure if uh, our scientists there are laughing at me, but, uh, but I just bring this up 
because we need to recognize that the DNA of life is not limited to those nucleic acids and chemicals. And yes, that is necessary for the physicality of life, but fellowship is what is ultimately the DNA of life. It is unavoidable to function, to, you know, for life to function. Some of you may have heard of Christopher McCandless. I may have mentioned his, uh, uh, his story some, you know, to, uh, sometime back or in some of my previous sermons. And if I can just mention, his life is captured in a movie. It is called Into the Wild. If any of you have Netflix, I would suggest you must go and watch that movie. It is called Into the Wild. And this man goes and lives by himself, thinking that he can isolate himself from community, from society, and live by himself. He was found dead about three months or four months later. I don't exactly remember the timing. But in his diary, he had penned and he said, happiness is real only if shared. To me, that, that tells me how important fellowship is, how important a sense of community is. I don't know who said this, but it's a very wonderful saying. It says, the greatest tragedy in life is experiencing a great moment and having no one to share it with. Isn't that profound? The greatest tragedy in life is experiencing a great moment and having no one to share it with. That is what fellowship is all about. Koinonia, as it is mentioned in the Greek, which means dynamic life, participation, interaction, interactive life, sharing. Now, that doesn't mean to say solitude uh, does not have any uh, uh, you know, value. We know from the biblical scriptures, a sense of solitude sometimes can be very transforming inner transformation can take place as you commune in solitude with god but why do we do that so that we can come back and relate to one another better isn't it so uh life let us not forget is fundamentally relational but it is in the community of the trinity second point here i'd like to mention if i can just uh Go back and share my screen again with you. Uh, right. The second point I'd like to share is that fellowship is the DNA for maturity and growth. I mentioned fellowship is the DNA for, you know, life itself. But what is life? You know, if you're not growing, you have stopped living. Life involves growth and maturity. As disciples of Jesus Christ, we are commanded, in fact, to grow, right? That is our vocation. But where does growth take place, right? Growth, growth takes place in the crucible of, of, of love, of encouragement, of exhortation, of admonition, of correction. You see, uh, it's only in a sense of community when there is that interaction in love where there is encouragement, an atmosphere of encouragement. And sometimes we are in the process of learning through exhortation. And maybe we sometimes even need admonition and correction. In all of this, that is where growth takes place and a, and a process of maturity takes place. You know, just like you strengthen your muscles uh, by pulling or pushing against a resistance or a weight. Muscles don't grow if you don't you know, in, involve yourself in that kind of process. Similarly, uh, fellowship is that DNA for maturity and growth. The, the uh, uh, maturity and growth takes place in the reality of community. You remember the book, the, the, the verse in Hebrews chapter 10. Uh, we have read this perhaps many a times. Let's read that once again. It says, and let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another. And all the more as you see the day approaching. So you begin to see this scripture shows the necessity of engaging in love 
and good deeds. But how can this happen? Only by meeting together, only by interaction with one another, only by fellowship. I'm reminded of uh, what Mrs. Noah mentioned in her, in her uh, video, which we uh, had made for uh, you know, the GCI Asia worship. Mrs. Noah mentioned uh, in her little, uh, little talk how she looks forward to worship because she has an opportunity when she comes for worship to give love and to receive love. And I thought that was very beautifully put. Uh, to be able to receive love and to give love. That is where growth and maturity takes place. Unfortunately, the scripture also mentions that some people are give up meeting together and it is becoming a habit with some. Some are not seeing the value of fellowship and that is very unfortunate. I remember the, reading the story of a pastor who had a small church and he had go, grown very close and fond with a, a, one of the members. And, but for some reason, this member didn't attend church for many weeks. He decided to go and visit that member. And the member seemed to indicate that there was no interest in him to want to attend church. But, in, but as they were discussing, they were, they were in, a, you know, in a, they had a fireplace in the house. The pastor removed one of the coal, you know, from the fireplace and put it aside. And then they kept talking. And then the member suddenly realized that coal, which was removed from the fire, was losing its ember. It was losing its heat and it was losing its fire. It was from red hot, it was going black again. Suddenly he realized that it is in fellowship that you retain your fire. You retain your ember. You retain your sense of Christianity. Right? Uh, uh, and as the scripture says, it is very important to do that even as we see the day approaching. So there is tremendous benefit in fellowship. Otherwise, we lose the, you know, the very fire of our Christian faith. And lastly, one more point I'd like to mention is talking about fellowship. Christian witness is most effective in loving fellowship. You know, I, I, I you know, let me remind ourselves that we are called to be Christian witnesses. Even as we read, uh, Selena was reading for us that we would be witnesses not only in Judea and Jerusalem, but the ends of the earth, the uttermost parts of the earth. We are called to be lights. We are called to be the salt of the earth, right? Even if we don't recognize it, we are still going to be the light of the world, as Jesus said. Uh, but light is meant to shed for others. It is, it is meant for, to be beneficial for others. And so I asked the question, where is our Christian witness most effective? And this is where we go back to another very familiar scripture where Jesus says, by this will all men know you are my disciples. If you love one another, notice, by this will all men know Christian witness. Your witness is most, most effective where? When you show love for one another. When people see a community of love, people meeting together to love and to serve and to do things together, to do life together, as the, uh, you know, the title says. Uh, so it is in the act of loving one another, in loving fellowship, where our Christian witness begins to shine most brightly. Our light shines most brightly. You know, let me ask a question here as we move along. How do we know God loves us? Because we know God loves us because Jesus came and fellowshiped with us. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. That is a practical demonstration of love, right? So the witness of, Christ, of God's love is seen in Jesus coming and fellowshipping with us. And of course, he's gone, he's gone on to promise that he will never leave us nor forsake us under the new covenant. In other words, he's committed to eternal fellowship. That is how real and powerful fellowship is. See, God's love is witnessed in Jesus fellowshipping with us. We can in turn be 
a witness for God by being in loving fellowship. Okay, so having mentioned those three points, let me bring some application to what we just discussed. Uh, where is fellowship, you know, uh, most important? And I give you three places where fellowship is so very important. How about family, right? Begin with your own family. Do you have time for one another? Fathers, mothers, do you have time for your children? Children, do you have time for your fathers and mothers? I'm talking about dedicated time, not just running around and, you know, just looking at each other. Dedicated time without cell phones. <laughs> without cell phones. Right. I was uh, I remember a counseling session I had with a mother. A mother came complaining about the child and the, and the mother said, you know, the child has no time for me. I'm always on the cell phone. Uh, the, the, and, you know, and, and she said, would you please help me, you know, talk to my child? And I did. I spoke to the child. And you know what the child told me? The child said, mother is always shouting at me. She would never sit with me just for a moment and talk to me nicely. She's always shouting at me. And then when we completed the, the uh, uh, counseling, I, I asked the mother, would you be able to take 10 or 15 minutes each day and just not shout but talk nicely and appreciate your daughter? And, uh, and I, hopefully it connected, I'm hoping, but you know, um, how about hanging out with, with your family <laughs> using the young, the young adults term? Let's hang out with the family. 10, 15 minutes a day, quality time, talk to each other, be interested in each other. Begin with the family. How about the church, right? Isn't it wonderful for us here in Hyderabad? We have this blessing of being a fellowship of where we can come together and meet and you know, rub shoulders together, eat together. Today was second Sunday. We would have eaten together if we had met uh, in person, uh, right? Uh, but uh, church is a place where fellowship, vibrant fellowship takes place, right? Now, that doesn't mean to say we are perfect and you will always, uh, you know, have a nice relationship with everybody. No, we are imperfect and... Uh, we are going to rub each other in the wrong side some way. But you know something? That's where you have an opportunity to forgive one another. If you're isolated, you have no opportunity to practice forgiveness. <laughs> so if there are people offending you, here's the opportunity to provide, to give forgiveness and be like Jesus. <laughs> so fellowship, church, very important. Let's continue to do that. Thank you so much for all of you for joining us today, at least virtually, but we look forward when we can meet together. And finally, another application, how about friends and neighbors? Please don't ignore your friends and neighbors, you know, make sure that you know one another and that way you never know how you can be of help and how you may be helped. Just the other day, I was on a conversation on a telephone call with the Nelson and we were discussing actually his sermon last week. Um, and suddenly Nelson re received and, you know, some, somebody was knocking at the door and he went and he said, uh, Mr. Zachary, I'll call you back. It's an emergency. I said, OK. And then about, he was gone for about 10 minutes or, so, or 15 minutes. I'm not sure. And he came back and he called me up and uh, we, we continued the conversation. I said, what happened? He said, my neighbor came and knocked. He wanted to be given an injection. And I had to get my wife to give him an injection. So you know where to go if you want an injection, right? So, uh, but I thought to myself, how wonderful. Neighbors living like friends in fellowship, strong fellowship, where you help one another, where you serve one another. Isn't that wonderful that we can live in a loving community and we as lights for Jesus Christ can be available to help, to serve and to show the love of Jesus. And to show that indeed life is done in community. We do life together. So brethren, as we complete here and conclude, let's do life together. You see, life is not worth living alone in isolation. Our life was meant to be lived in a loving fellowship, in loving community.
And that is exactly what God wants for us. Even as he says, you know, uh, even as Jesus begins to show us that he is willing to come and live with us. And we celebrate the Advent for that particular purpose. And that is where the Holy Communion makes all so much meaning, right? Jesus Christ introduced the Holy Communion so that we may know that it is his purpose to live with us in Holy Communion. Isn't that wonderful to know that Jesus is inviting us uh, to be in fellowship, not just with him, but also with the Father and the Holy Spirit. Right In that loving community, we have fellowship, you know, also with one another. Uh, and finally, it is in this community of fellowship that our joy is made complete. Our joy indeed is made complete. Brethren, the day is coming when God's dwelling will be with us. He has promised to come and dwell with us. His, it, his dwelling is going to be eternally with us. And indeed, that's the time when the prayer that we pray, maybe so often, will be fulfilled. May your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. When heaven and earth come together, when Father, Son, Holy Spirit embrace us and gather us into their loving community, we can be forever in that loving community. And so, uh, as GCI, as GCI, let's continue. To do life together. To enjoy community together. Those of you who would like to participate in the communion. I'd like to pray for the elements as we partake in the communion. Join with me as we ask for God's blessing upon the elements. Gracious loving father. How wonderful to know that you have instituted community. Not just amongst us as human beings, but you yourself will participate in doing life together. And so gracious Lord, uh, as we partake in the communion today, we are reminded that Jesus is inviting us into himself. And in, in himself, we have fellowship with the Father and of course in the Holy Spirit. So. Bless this bread as a symbol of the, of the body broken for us. Bless this wine and the wine and the bread that all of us hold together as a symbol of the shed blood of Jesus Christ for us. And as we partake of this, gracious Lord, bless our community, bless our communion, bless our fellowship that we may enjoy not only with one another, with you as Father, Son, Holy Spirit, but with one another, that our joy may be made complete. Thank you in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You can take your bread at this time. And uh, as we remember, Jesus Christ tabernacled amongst us and dwelt amongst us. His body was broken for us. The body of Jesus Christ. As you take your wine, the blood poured out upon the cross for us so that we would be cleansed and we would have opportunity for eternal communion with Father, Son, Holy Spirit, the blood of Jesus. God bless you all, brethren.